به نستعين صلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين القاهرين Today, inshallah, I want to share two important concepts in Islamic morality. One is tawadu, and the other is adabul amana. But I want to talk about them and how they apply to us as teachers. So let's start with tawadu. Tawadu, we translate it as humility and humbleness. It's very important for a person to be humble. In fact, in the hadith we're told that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has appointed two angels in the heavens. And they just look for humbleness. The hadith says, فَمَنْ تَوَاضَعَ رَفَعَاهُ Whoever is humble, <coughs> they raise him. وَمَنْ تَكَبَّرَ And whoever tries to raise himself, to be proud, to boast, they make sure that he goes down. وَضَعَاهُ They put him down. So humbleness is important. But usually when we think of humbleness, we think of somebody who has a soft voice, somebody who doesn't give preference to himself, gives preference to others, somebody who doesn't take up high positions in society, for example, right? Somebody who doesn't say, you know what, I have a place for myself in this gathering. No, he's very humble. <coughs> but there's something also called humbleness in academia, humbleness in education, humbleness in knowledge as well to realize that I don't know everything. And there are some things which I don't know. And it's possible for somebody else, even though he's younger than me, even though he's not studied as much as me, right? That maybe he knows something that I don't know. And that I should be willing, not just to listen to him, but also to hear him. Not just to hear him, but also to listen to him as well. That humility and humbleness is very important. To realize that as teachers, Yes, we're teaching a class, but that doesn't mean that we know everything. The best example of this in the Quran is, the best example of this in the Quran is, Musa. Prophet Musa in Khaybar, right? Mm -hmm. Prophet Musa, you know who was Prophet Musa? He wasn't just a Nabi, he's not just a Rasul, he's Ulul Azmi min al Rasul, one of those five prophets who are said to have strong resolve. Of all the prophets mentioned in the Quran, including Prophet Muhammad, the name of Muhammad, the name of Prophet Musa appears the most in the Quran. You know who Prophet Musa was? He is known as Kalimullah, the one who spoke directly with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yet we're told this Prophet Musa, when he heard that there is a Khidr, and Khidr, there's even a debate whether he was a prophet or he wasn't a prophet. When he heard there is a Khidr, <coughs> look at what he says. He says to his Musa Remember that time when Musa said to his fata, to his young man. There was a young lad who was with him. This young lad, it seems, was his student. So this was a time when Prophet Musa was a teacher. Okay. In fact, in some of the books, the Ahl Sunnah books, and Abay um, Qara'ati, <coughs> he quotes this in his tafsir. He says, do you know what prompted Musa to go and search for Khidr? What prompted Musa is one day Prophet Musa was giving a khutbah, a sermon. Somebody stood up in the middle of the sermon and asked, oh Musa, who's the most knowledgeable of people? And what did Prophet Musa say? He said, it is me of course. I am the Prophet of God. And at that same moment he got reprimanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to say, no Musa, don't make that assumption. There could be somebody who knows something which you don't know. When he realized that, that humbleness and tawadu came within him. So listen to what he says to his student now. He says, لا أبرح حتى أبلغ مجمع البحرين أو أمضي حقبة. I'm not going to cease looking for this person until I meet the, you know, <coughs> the gathering of the two seas, which is a place very far away, or I have traveled for years and years. I'm going to look for this person. <coughs> Now, when he, you know, goes looking for Prophet Khidr or for Khidr, and he meets Khidr, listen to what he says to Khidr. He says to Khidr, هَلْ أَتَّبِعُكَ عَلَىٰ أَن تُعَلِّمَنِي مِمَّا عُلِّمْتَ Would you allow me? He humbles himself as a Prophet of God in front of another person, and he says, Would you allow me that I would travel with you and be with you so that you may teach me something from what you have been taught? For what reason? رُشْدًا What does Rushd mean? 
Rushed means growth. Rushed means progress. Everybody has room for growth and progress within himself. Even a prophet of God has room for growth and progress within himself. Growth in his knowledge, growth in his intellect, growth in his character as well. And therefore, one important reminder for ourselves as teachers is that even though we're teachers, more importantly, we're students. More than being teachers, we are students. That's the one. <clears throat> A second concept I wanted to share was Ada'ul Amana. Ada'ul Amana means that when somebody gives you a trust, you take care of that trust and you return it the way he gave it to you. So if somebody comes up to you and says, I want you to keep this jewelry for me, and I'll come back after a year and get it from you. When he comes back after a year, you give it to him as it was without making any changes, without any loss in that jewelry. But just like tawadu is a very profound concept in Islam, ada'ul amana is also a very profound concept in Islam. It's not just limited to tangible things. Sometimes an amana is intangible. So, as a teacher, when I walk into class, I have an amana. That amana is called Islam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has charged me with the responsibility of passing Islam to my students. Therefore, when I pass this Islam to my students, I surpass it as it has been given to me. I should not do khiyana Islam. I should not inject my personal thought, my personal opinion, my personal feelings, my personal understanding, and then package it and call it Islam and pass it on to the students. That would be doing khiyana in the amana that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given. When does this happen? This happens usually in two cases. <clears throat> the first case is when a student stands up in class and he asks us a question. And he asks us a question and we don't know the answer. So as we struggle in the front of the whole class, we try to conjure up an answer. Something that makes sense to us. And then we give that answer. And we're not even sure if this is exactly the right answer. What have our scholars said about this? What have the, the Imam said about this? The best answer to give when you don't have an answer is to say, I don't know. I'll find out. Exactly. You should never be ashamed to say, I don't know. You know. One of the things that I try to have in my mind is, whenever somebody starts to ask me a question, I tell myself, your first answer should be, I don't know. All right? Then if you can think of a proper answer, if I remember something, I'll say, yes, that's the answer. Or I'll say, I don't know. And that's fine. One day a lady came up to an alim. <coughs> he probably was a sayyid and a big amama. This lady asked him a question. It seemed like a question in fiqh, something that was straightforward, right? And this alim, he learned, listened to the question and he said, I don't know the answer. She got very upset at him. He said, you're an alim. You're wearing an amama. And you're telling me you don't know? You know what he answered? He said, this amama has been given to me for the things that I know. If they gave me an amama for the things that I didn't know, I wouldn't be able to wear it. So, I don't know. The second time this happens is when we walk into a class and we don't prepare for that class. As a rule of thumb, you should always, in terms of content, know more than you're going to teach. Two or three times more than you're going to teach. How do you know more? By reading books, by listening to lectures, by going to seminars, by going for courses, <coughs> right? but not just by thinking about it. And not just saying during the week, I thought about it, this is how it made sense to me, and now I'm going to present it to class. It's important for us to ground ourselves in the books, in what the scholars have said, in what the hadith has said, in what the Quran has said, and not just conjure up these things. Right? Even as I prepare for lectures, and, and the third time I'm presenting, as a rule of thumb, I feel it is important for me still to look in the books and then present the topic. Because when we don't look in the books and we don't ground ourselves, then this is called tafsir berra'i. This is called interpreting the Quran or interpreting the religion based on our own personal opinion. And that is something that has been not allowed in our faith. Now, you'll say, Brother Murtaza, you're discouraging us from being teachers because you're putting a heavy burden on us. <clears throat> There's a very beautiful rule of thumb in Islam. It applies to judges, it applies to mufassirin of the Qur'an, it applies to teachers as well. <clears throat> when a person is doing tafsir of the Qur'an, we're told that, let's say, he strives hard, he comes up with a methodology, 
he looks at what the other commentators have said. Then, with this knowledge, he does the seal of the Quran. If he gets it right, he gets two times the reward. If he gets it wrong, he gets the reward once. Why? Because he tried. On the other hand, if a person doesn't try, he just thinks about it, puts together a personal opinion, and then presents it as a tafsir of the Qur'an, a tafsir of the religion, if he gets it right, there is no reward for him. Let's say by chance and coincidence, he got it right, there is no reward for him. And if he gets it wrong, well, there is a punishment of him. So the goal is not to get it right necessarily. We're human beings. We're not masoom. But the point is, we need to try and make sure that we've put our effort into it. Last two things I want to mention is one thing some of you might have received in the emails is that inshallah right after Eid, right after the month of Ramadan, uh, Dr. Muhammad Ali Shomali is holding a one week course in Toronto. And I think Dr. Shomali is a wonderful scholar, um, you know, a very profound scholar, one of the scholars that I would highly recommend you to listen to and to read his books. He's holding a one week course on Aqaid and how to teach Aqaid. And from what I've been told is that the madrasa will be covering the fees for the course, and the madrasa will also be providing another $500 um, for your travel costs and also for your lodging as well. Anything extra then would be uh, uh, up to you. Highly recommend you to join this course, um, but if you are planning to do that, then please do let the administrators know by the middle of next week, inshallah. The last thing as well, Middle of the coming week, sorry. So in another four to five days. Three days, okay. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. And the last thing is Dr. Ali Muhammad has asked us to pray for his brother, uh, Brother Hussein Muhammad, who is undergoing cancer for the third time, or treatment for cancer for the third time. So let's remember his brother and all those uh, uh, brothers and sisters who are in difficulty and those who are sick and pray for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant them a complete and quick recovery by reciting the Ayah of Shifa. Bismillah.